Hello, dear friends. Today, in the Alatra TV studio, we welcome the esteemed Igor Mihalovich Danilov. Greetings. Igor Mihalovich, spiritual path of a person is rarely smooth, and it is surely full of both ups and downs. Some people find it difficult to even take the first steps because there are misunderstandings. Others actually follow purely the path of external actions. While some people go in the opposite direction. Some go in the opposite direction, while others reach the middle of the way and stop because they simply don't know how to move forward. But perhaps the most common and great disappointment is when your ship seems to be sailing towards spiritual shores, and suddenly it runs around an ordinary everyday life, with its mundane routine, sometimes with difficult relationships between relatives, loved ones and colleagues. And then people have a question. And most often with oneself. With oneself. All that is already secondary. Relatives, colleagues and friends — everything is secondary. When there is no peace inside, there is no peace in the external either. Everything, my friends, starts with ourselves, while all the rest are excuses, like it's someone's fault, they don't understand me at home, they don't understand me at work, or something else. I am striving for spiritual enlightenment, but they treat me as a religious fanatic or a sectarian. Those are excuses. It doesn't matter who thinks of you and what they think of you. What matters is how you treat yourselves. That's where it all begins. Isn't it so? But there is the following interesting point that can be observed. The thing is that when a person is on his own, let's say, in prayer or in spiritual practice, then this path is easier for him, it is easier for him to open up and… While he is on his own and in prayer. Again, if prayer is not material, if it is really aimed at spiritual contemplation, at unity with the spiritual world, then it is so, yes. Even if he doesn't have a lot of practice, but he has inner aspiration and he is sincere, while being in the temple or at home, it doesn't matter where he is. But if he is in this state of prayer, then he indeed feels confident, he feels safe, and a person begins to open up. But it's enough for him to stop this practice, to look around, something catches his eye, and everything immediately disappears. And what overloads him again? A lot of troubles, right? A lot of worries. Absolutely right. Mundane problems. Absolutely right. So people live such a double life, because on the one hand, in their allotted time… Well, double. If double, it's good. But more often, there are a lot more parallels in our lives. Yes, it turns out that on the one hand, there is God and spiritual and moral values, but on the other hand, there is everyday life and problems of everyday life. So a person maneuvers between these two. You know, the problem is that today the word God for many people, is like a culture, a habit, while spiritual life means to observe some morals a little bit, but at the same time to remain an inveterate consumer, an egoist, fixated on his problems and eager to be loved by everyone. Many people even go to religion in order to be loved, to be loved at least by God. That is, they don't learn to love, they look for those who would love them. And in religion they seek to be loved. Yet, in spiritual practices or on the spiritual path, the first thing a person must learn is to love. A person must learn to love instead of seeking those who would love him, and certainly not to desire or wait for God to love him. If you don't love God, how will He love you? Everything is very simple. So it really turns out that prayer is the first impulse of love, or that first seed which a person plants. No, prayer is already an action. Prayer, spiritual practice, all this is already a certain action. While the first impulse is when a person looks into himself and feels that everything is not as he was taught at school, in kindergarten or at home. It doesn't matter. Everything is not so material. A person feels that there is something greater, something that cannot be expressed in words. And this is the first impulse, the first step. And then he seeks fulfillment in religion, 
in some spiritual self-development or in something else. It's interesting that it is also said that any prayer is basically needed to reach this state of purity, which is followed by contemplation. Not any prayer, no. If we take modern religions, there are a lot of magic prayers. Exactly prayers that are aimed at magical action. Sort of a spell for consumerism. Well, this is really so. Yes. And, unfortunately, this was embedded in many religions a long time ago. And these are not the practices which lead to God, let's say. Many know them. When there is a desire for material things, forgetting or, let's say, pushing aside spiritual development and spiritual salvation, a person utters, I wouldn't say that it's a prayer, it's more of a spell, this magic formula, let's say, or a material mantra of some kind for acquiring something material. Although all the prophets who came here said, one mustn't practice magic, and they also said, do not ask God for anything but spiritual salvation. It's the highest value. It's the only thing we should spend our attention on. And this spiritual salvation, God's love, is the only thing we can ask for. But at the same time, if we don't learn to love God, if we don't strive for Him with all our soul and mind, again, that's why it was said with our mind in the beginning, because we must force even the mind to strive for the spiritual world, that is, to keep it within spiritual limitations, morality, ethics and all the rest, then it's easier and simpler, then the path really opens up. But if we, you know, treat it as something transitory, now I want to pray, ask for something, do magic, beg for some material goods, and tomorrow I am immersed in everyday life, in matter, and then once a week I remember and go to church, light a candle, take communion, repent. You know how it is in the modern world. Are you sinful? I am. I am sinful in everything. So they read out a list to everybody, from murder to stealing, and in everything you are sinful. We also encounter that people often say that it is necessary to sort of raise these inner vibrations, the vibrations of the soul. But then you understand why they do this. They say it's because at some point some desires quickly come true. And really, when you look at people who follow the spiritual path, there indeed comes a moment when suddenly events begin to fit together unexpectedly yes to come true even what you once dreamed of which is that he once dreamed of yes because when a person follows the spiritual path his only aspiration and dreams are exactly aimed at spiritual enlightenment while the material is something natural this doesn't mean that a person ceases to exist in three-dimensionality no he exists and he exists wonderfully he has a job a household friends and everything in the world let's say nothing goes anywhere but it ceases to be dominant in a person himself. Why? Because the main goal and where he spends most of his attention is spiritual enlightenment. And this is where the tricks come in. That is, at this moment a person doesn't seek or dream of material things. If he needs something, he earns money and buys it. Let's say this is ordinary life, simple math. But those dreams which a person once had begin to come true. It happens far and wide. Why? Because at this moment a person begins, well, let's say, he wanted a position of some kind, whatever, and here he is offered, or some material benefits, and he begins to receive them. And at that moment a thought comes to him. You see, you are on the spiritual path, you have become stronger spiritually, and now everything that you once wanted is given to you. And a person turns towards magic. This exactly shows why many religions are so full of magic, because it all comes down to such a phenomenon in the end. Why does this happen? It's an interesting question as well. However fantastical it may sound, but when a person truly and seriously embarks on the spiritual path without playing around and betraying God, the devil tries to seduce him. And what does he try to seduce him by? By old patterns. He makes a person's dream come true, the one he had even before he took the spiritual path. After all, the prince of this world possesses everything. 
that's why for him, I mean, he possesses everything in this three-dimensionality, and all matter is his, from job position, from health to material goods. In fact, it won't be difficult for him even to take someone and make him a king over all kings, because he is the supreme king. Everything belongs to him. But to lead a human astray from the spiritual path means, let's say, to take care of the devil's future. Why? Because for him, anyone who has gone to God is his loss. Let's put it this way. Defeat of the devil, right? Yes, surely. But he doesn't want to lose what is his. That's why… And he actually considers all of us his slaves, his property and his revenues. Therefore, he takes care of his, so to say, liquid assets. Concerning these tricks and this spiritual battle which the devil wages against a human, it is said in Christianity in particular that the devil surely stops people at the first stage by saying that the spiritual path is very difficult, so don't you even move there, and indeed it has been noticed. Well, it's actually a dialogue in one's head. The devil gives emotions, this sensation, throws in an emotion of emptiness, indignation, some irritation, anger, or, on the contrary, apathy. And he immediately inputs thoughts that the spiritual path is not for you, you are nobody and nothing. But I will tell you the following, my friends. If the devil machinates, it means you are worthy of something. It means there is something to fight for, and not everything is lost in your case yet. And when everything is given easily and simply, it means he is so annoyed with you, that he simply wants to push you out. Such things happen too. When people embark on the spiritual path so decisively and in their service scheme against the devil himself so much that it's easier for him to get rid of this person than to fight him. Because he is already not a human at all, but a much higher being. Then even the devil is powerless over him. There is also a second point concerning the devil's schemes. It is when a person really feels this first moment, the first spiritual surge and goes to God, and he cannot be stopped. Surely the devil doesn't approach such people at once, as the Holy Fathers say, but he approaches them when they start getting lazy and this… Distraction. Distraction, yes. Exactly, laziness is a distraction. You know, when such a material state comes, when a person gets carried away by something in everyday life or at work, it doesn't matter, and he starts putting all his attention into some goal, forgetting about the inner. That is when Satan comes. In simple things. It's enough to enter, and that's it. An emotion appears somewhere. Somewhere you already got offended at someone. Somewhere someone looked in a wrong way. Someone did in pain fool. Some injustice. By the way, the devil also often catches on injustice throws in such thoughts that there is injustice towards me. Meanwhile, I is always above all. Yes. And as soon as your I started exalting itself, it means you are already in trouble. As a matter of fact, one can hardly find a person in the world who wouldn't get offended himself or wouldn't offend anyone. Yes, meaning… It is also one of the most serious tools. After all, what did all the prophets talk about? About the fact that we shouldn't get offended. No matter how somebody wants to offend you, don't be offended, forgive everything. And what's even better, don't perceive it at all. If someone seeks to offend you, it means you are worth it. And not in a bad sense, but in a good sense. Even the nearest and dearest, let's say, friends, doesn't matter. The ones from whom you are used to getting support and help, they start hurting you. It happens, they have such a mischievous mood or something else, or, on the contrary, they become angry in a bad mood and start offending you. Then you should ponder, why does it happen so? Just a simple thought. If you let a grudge in, it means you have lost this chess game, and exactly the Grandmaster Satan has loaded you with stones. And you will walk around with this rucksack with stones for a long, long time, before getting rid of it. But the best option is not to put this rucksack on at all, right? And when they try to hurt you, you should simply understand, why do they do that, and who does it? If a person whom you respect and love starts offending you, he does so not by his will. 
Here, on the contrary, you need to show sympathy for this person, because at this moment he, as a personality, is nothing but Satan's tool, he doesn't control himself. Even though it seems to him that he is free, he defends justice by offending you. But if you take offense, it means that you have lost. You must not bear a grudge. I would say it's not just the heaviest metal, but also a red-hot metal, which you have to carry, because it burns, it stings, it takes all your strength away and instigates bad thoughts. One thing clings to another, and the further, the more. The devil incites revenge, evil or something else. And if you carry evil in yourself, then who are you? Are you actually good? A simple question. It turns out that this feeling is not so humble and harmless. If there is evil in you, yes. is there a God in you? Is there a God's love in you? Of course not. If evil dominates in you. While resentment is also evil, the same thing, it's poison, which destroys and kills. Right? Right. There is also such a life situation. After all, most people who are offended, let's say, by outer life, by other people, often for many people resentment has been lingering since childhood. They go to God for comfort. And here in the Bible we find the words that when you start praying, you must forgive. Because if you don't forgive, then God will not accept you and doesn't forgive you either. Well, this is and right. And it's a shock for people. How come? It seems like, how can he be so cruel? After all, I'm right. This pain was inflicted on me unjustly. Well, wait. God is love. He cannot be cruel. Right. But God sees love. He doesn't see hatred. He doesn't see anger. It's our world. It's very narrow and very small, while God is all-embracing. We have plenty of worlds. There is a huge, countless number of them, even a huge number of parallel worlds. And here, where we are, there is plenty of life. Even in the space between us, there is plenty of life, living life. And God is love. Will He watch every, I'm sorry, molecule, which is in ambitions and anger? Why would He need it? We don't watch this kind of thing either, right? Just a simple question. What do we notice looking at birds, or generally coexisting with birds? We notice how beautiful it flies, how beautifully it sings, and how beautiful it looks, right? Or how wrong it acted, having stained your car or a human. That is, what do we notice? Bad and good. We are humans. We are dual. We see evil and we see good. God doesn't have evil. He doesn't have it and cannot have it, because He is God. He doesn't have it. And He cannot see it. It's not His, it's ours. It is what we exist in. We exist in the material world. There are, excuse me, physical interactions of different bodies, there is friction, there are processes of gravitational interaction, and, let's say, of other powers — weak, strong, and so on. It causes chemical reactions and many other things. Just look, the entire complexity is in its simplicity, right? There is a mass of emotions — good ones, bad ones, and so on. Here even good people become angry. Not always, but it happens. Why? Because this world, this chemical kitchen, all the alchemy of this world belongs to Satan. And only life and love belong to God. That is, everything belongs to Him. Because all this, all the worlds are what God created. In one of the videos, we already said that it's enough for God just to think for it to be. And it manifests. But He sees us only when we are worthy of it. When we love God. When we live. And when life begins in us, when we join the spiritual world, that is when God sees us too. You see, it's simple, and it was talked about since ancient times, many knew about it, and there were so many saints, real saints, who comprehended these spiritual practices and really came to God. They described their path, and they described it exactly this way, that they felt God and understood what life is, 
and in response they received God's love, didn't they? Yes, when you direct prayer, you get this contemplation in response. You see That's how right. this grain that was sown grows into a huge field of ears. Absolutely right. How generous He is. That is the point. That is what they were talking about. And they said, when we are with Satan, we stay in the shadows. God doesn't see us, because we don't go to Him. That is true. But when we stay in the shadows, what do we do? We appeal to God with a mantra or a magic formula in the form of a prayer, and we start begging for what? For material goods, while remaining in the service to Satan. And then, what do we do? We resent God for not giving it to us. Or we pretend that we love God. We perform all the rituals of one or another religion, which we belong to, we perform all these ritual actions, everything as it should be, as we are told. But afterwards we get into trouble. And we blame whom? God. Because He closed His eyes at the critical moment and didn't see and let something happen to us. Isn't that so? Yes, shifting responsibility all the time. Simony. That is what I meant. So we engage in simony and shift responsibility. And we forget about love. What is also frightening is that we are afraid of God. Isn't that so? It is. And then we think, why doesn't God love us? And why is there no life in us? After all, it's very easy. When a person lives with God, he is never alone. He never has sadness and grief. All he has to do is to look inside himself. And there is boundlessness, there is life, and everything external simply ceases to exist. This is really so. This is true prayer. This is precisely the divine component which awakens in each of us. Because in each of us there is a particle of the spiritual world, isn't it so? In Sufism they say that when you go to Him, He rushes towards you. So great is this response and so great is this joy of meeting. Of course. And how wonderful He is. Yes. But it is us who put obstacles for ourselves on the way to spiritual salvation, in fact, on the way to life. By our choice, our laziness, in fact, by listening to the whisper in our head. After all, the devil hasn't taken any of us by the scruff of our necks and hasn't pulled us out of heaven, has he? Does he really do anything? No. He merely throws in a thought. He merely makes us feel some emotion, hatred or envy. He forces us to live by anger, not to live, but to exist. It is bread for him, and it is life for him, while we forget that everything living in the shadows feeds owing to our weakness, owing to our lack of spirituality, and owing to our betrayal of God. As a matter of fact, when we stand in opposition to God, we betray Him. That is, we betray the Lord when we start serving Satan. Isn't that so? When we are angry, are we actually with God? When we envy, are we with God? And when we take offense, and when we start performing a prayer practice while being offended. It is said that the prayer of a rancorous person is the same as sowing on a stone, meaning it's fruitless. In this case, they tried to sort of say a wise thing, but they said a folly. Sowing on a stone is a destiny of prophets, or those who truly serve God. Those ones carry the grain while serving God. Whereas the one who performs spiritual practice in rancor simply engages in foolishness. In other words, he practices magic, because in rancor, in anger, a person doesn't ask for God's love and doesn't strive to love. He asks for something material. He again starts using these magic formulas and mantras. This is not prayer. These are appeals to Satan. There is also such a point that, in Islam, there are such words that the most hateful to Allah is a person who is implacable in disputes. I would also like to talk about this, because… That is pridefulness. What is a dispute? It is defense of one's point of view, defense of the truth or something else. 
I'll put it this way, my friends. When a person knows the truth, he doesn't argue. He merely observes the one who is mistaken. He can support, he can share an opinion. But to prove to a person who doesn't know the truth that the truth exists, that is ridiculous. Why? Because the one who is convinced that he knows, though he doesn't know, he always defends, because he actually understands that he doesn't know the truth. But he tries to impose his opinion through his aggression. A dispute is a lack of knowledge, a lack of experience, isn't it? But when a person has experience and true knowledge, he won't enter a dispute with anyone. That is why it is actually said that those who argue are hateful to Allah, yes. Yes. That's right. Why? Because the only one who wins a dispute is Satan. Isn't it so? Although many people think that in disputes truth is born, and they try to figure out, is this really so or not? Dispute and dialogue are different things. When we try to figure out where the truth is, we compare and analyze. We are on equal footing. We have no emotions and no negation towards each other. We don't have pridefulness and superiority over one another. While the whole dispute and the essence of dispute is when two egos are arguing. Any ego tries to exalt itself over another ego. You know, it's the devil's swing, meaning he elevates one, then the other one, while in fact both pay tribute to him, and they pay tribute with their lives. This is foolish and ridiculous. Let's say, God simply doesn't see them, while that is already an explanation for people that they are hateful to Allah. Allah doesn't see them, they don't exist for him as long as they are in the shadows. Do you know how I would compare this? Such an association has come. Imagine that Allah is the Sun. After all, in the past, the Sun was called Ra, associatively. So the Sun is shining with straight beams, and it sees everything that is in the Sun. But there is a shadow, that which is hidden from the Sun. So everything that is in the shadow is hidden from Allah's face. Cool. Thus, it's simple and easy. Be in the Sun. Be before Allah, love Him with all your heart, and He will see you, because you become like a rock, like a huge mountain that is shining itself. It is impossible not to notice such a thing. But when you hide in the shadows, you are like a mouse under a skirting board or under a wardrobe. How can God see you when you serve Satan? In no way. While those who serve God, those who are near God, do they turn out to be rays of this whole of this sun? Those who serve God? Well, that's a slightly different thing. Igor Mihalovich, I would also like to touch upon such a topic as fanaticism. It seems to be so far away from every person. No, it's not far. Very many people suffer from fanaticism. Fanaticism is a lack of knowledge and an unwillingness to learn. After all, Organizations are arranged in such a way, I mean, those dealing with the spiritual development, they are arranged in such a way that everything they do is aimed at development of the organization itself and at supporting its authority, its power, the power of the organization itself. Therefore, these organizations are interested in their adherents to be fanatics. Why do they forbid to read something different, to study something, saying that all this is from Satan, don't you dare, and so on? After all, learning cannot be from Satan or from God. Learning is our freedom, the freedom of personality. We cannot make a choice if we haven't learned. And when we are forbidden to learn something, this imposition exactly comes from Satan, but not from God. God has said, you are free in your choice and in your service. You are entitled to choose life or death, only you, human. Therefore, any knowledge is open to you, and you can study it, and you must study it. How can it be otherwise? Yet, when there is prohibition, it is definitely the devil's hand. But then a person becomes a fanatic. Here is, let's say, certain literature for you. Here is an action plan for you, a guidance for life, while everything else you should brush aside, and then you will be saved. That is, they give a very simple and easy formula. It is enough for you to follow certain rules that they have told you. For example, certain clothes, a certain hairdo, a certain behavior in everyday life, 
at home and with respect to the given religious organization. And that's it. Heaven is guaranteed to you. Do you see what the point is? They cover the path to God with external actions, because the path to God lies only through your heart. I mean, through the soul. That is, through the internal. They cover all this with an external action and impose that everything else must be denied. And a person becomes fanatical. Why fanatical? Because he is empty inside. And he knows that. And here is the biggest paradox. A person internally knows and understands that he hasn't found God, that there is no power in him, the power of love itself, but there is a certain set of actions in him. He understands that if he acts this way, for they actually told him, but he forgets that it is people who told him, not the prophets. It is not God's prophets who told him to be like this, but it is people who speak on their behalf. And the person is simply convinced. Having chosen an easy way for himself, which is supposed to guarantee and ensure normal existence for him afterwards, or a free pass to heaven, sort of a passing ticket, he actually becomes a fanatic defending these delusions. These are very convenient people for an organization. While in the spiritual sense, well, pardon me, let's say anyone who really engaged in spiritual development expanded their outlook on other religions and on everything else. And so many saints who really came to God through spiritual knowledge were ordinary people. But eventually they came to an understanding that God is one, to such a universal formula, right? That all prophets are from Him, and they said the same truth. They came with the same purpose, and they came not to some chosen nation, but to everyone. And they talked to all people. Saints came to a simple understanding that God is love, while everything else is intrigues of Satan and his slaves. Or rather, it is the intrigues of Satan through the actions of his slaves. This will be more correct. As a matter of fact, being in Satan's slavery, we ourselves do all this. We distort the truth. We enslave our own personality with our consciousness. And we also strive to enslave others. In the hope of something better, we lose the truth. Indeed, there actually exists no monopoly on the truth. The truth cannot belong… And there cannot exist. The truth belongs to God. No one, even the devil, dares to encroach on it. But nevertheless, it is mangled, it is distorted. People are people. So fanaticism is an extremely dangerous thing. It doesn't lead to God. Fanaticism leads exactly to hell. This is really so. A person is always filled with hatred, yes. Right. If we look at fanatics, evil predominates in them, hatred predominates in them, and there is no love in them. Yes, intolerance towards a neighbor, towards his point of view. Many people noticed. I'll give a simple example. In many temples, we won't select any religion. That's the trouble of all temples and all religious organizations when there always appears someone overly spiritual, enlightened, a bodhisattva or, let's say, a saint, who rebuffs everyone, growls at everyone, and he is fierce like a dog, while being in God's temple. Well, who hasn't encountered such people? He sets his rules. He sets the rules, exactly. Yes, such a thought has also come that, indeed, fanaticism from the perspective of being such a definite defense of one's position, one's point of view, and intolerance towards another person's point of view, it is also a phenomenon of everyday life. As a matter of fact, it turns out that in all these disputes, in family, in everyday life, each of us is basically a fanatic of consciousness. Of course. In other words, we remain manipulated by Satan. Yes. It doesn't matter what the reason of our dispute is and what we defend. Just look how people argue and defend. If you yourself want to argue. What awakens inside? Where does it come from? After all, if we look even at the human structure or at subjective physical sensations, everything is identical. Where it arises, how it moves inside the body. It's just that people, you see, I'll put it this way, people have been weaned from looking. People have been trained to listen. Yet the difference is huge. When a person looks inside himself, when he observes those processes which take place, how this anger or hatred or an eagerness to argue kindles in him, how these energy waves go on, 
and what their color is, because in this world everything is nothing else but a digit and a color, right? And we again come to what? To those very vibrations. Everything happens this way, a simple and elementary way. As soon as a certain emotion starts seizing you, look where it comes from and what it will give you. I mean, in this case, it is necessary to look at the causes and consequences. Even if there are no consequences, there is still a cause. A desire to argue or to prove something emerged in you. It doesn't matter what it relates to. A recipe for cooking some dish or a spiritual aspect, doesn't matter. Everything is identical. But you are trying to defend something of your own. What is boiling up in you? That's the question. It is boiling up. Right. A chemical reaction occurs in you. Again, with redistribution of certain energy. Right? Mm -hmm. You get drawn into this process. And you already become dependent on this process. Why is it very difficult to withdraw from a dispute? Because there is the dominance of selfishness. Isn't that so? It is. Debates gain a special heat when there are of also course. spectators around. Oh, if there are spectators, then all the more so. Because you have somebody to pose before. Again, what is it? Selfishness, pridefulness, and all the components of exactly human worthlessness. To infect another person, yes. Or I would put it this way, all the distinctive features of Satan's slave. Right. After all, based on observations as well, when an interlocutor defends a certain point of view, you automatically, you actually trace how a desire to defend a completely opposite point of view arises. You know, like quantum entanglement in physics. Of course, even if you know that you are definitely wrong. Plus here, sharp minus there. Minus is immediately manifested there. How can it be otherwise? Yes, and vice versa. Because these are material particles. The same is with people, they are material. As soon as an interconnection occurs, while interconnection is, pardon me, not just love or some desire or aspiration for something, it is also hatred, it is also resistance, it is also, as they say, sporting passion to win over somebody, meaning such a confrontation. All these are actually components of one and the same dish, Satan's dish, that we are, in fact, we, humanity, are actually his kitchen. I would also like to talk about gratitude, because the following is said about gratitude. In particular, in Sufism, they say that is the first step towards God. And in Christianity, I also encountered interesting words that thanksgiving, meaning to God, both for oneself and necessarily for one's neighbor, gets a person off the ground and turns people into angels. For one's neighbor? It's already added. Excuse me. Thanking God for a neighbor is an element of magic. And it was already added by those very religious organizations. Look, how subtle substitutions take place. After all, why have I called Satan the Grandmaster of this world? Because he is very smart. He has existed for billions of years. He has seen many people, and he has seen everything. That's why the function of this program is to delude us. Why? If we are not worthy, and if we go for it, hence we don't have the right to enter the spiritual world. We are weak, we are immature, and we don't deserve being a part of the spiritual world. Now I'll digress a little bit and simply try to explain. Imagine, let's take the example of stones. There are precious stones of a certain purity. The highest purity of a diamond that's one thing. Well, there are diamonds with inclusions, with impurity, and the price sharply decreases. Why? Because they have inclusions. Can they be compared in price or in something else in such a case? They cannot, right? Yet there is glass. It also resembles a diamond. It resembles, yes. But it's not worth anything. Is the difference clear? Yes. The same is here. Thus, the worthiest, the purest and the solidest ones deserve to enter the spiritual world. Whereas those with inclusions of desires, impurity and selfishness, well, how can such people be led into the spiritual world? They will not be equal among the equals. Right, or a glass counterfeit. Or just a counterfeit. Simony that shines like a diamond. But it is actually a glass kifa. Right? So, what does the substitution consist in? When a person thanks God for himself, and necessarily there is an inclusion for another person too. 
Do you understand? It is natural that a person should thank God. It is natural. It is a message of love and gratitude, especially when he feels a response or when positive, spiritually positive, changes take place in him, when he begins to feel this freedom, when these shadows disappear from him, when he becomes, let's say, like that diamond in the sun, saturating itself with this light, and he is capable of illuminating somebody. And here, naturally, comes what? What can we give God except love and gratitude? Nothing. And from here comes gratitude. It is an inner need and a state. We redirect our attention. But we are being told, and necessarily, for another person. And here an element of magic begins. Because we address, we as personality, and only we can have contact with God. Only for ourselves. However, we start addressing God with gratitude for the fact that He gave me a good friend or something else. Look, what a nice friend, and so on. Thank you, Lord. And a material dialogue begins. From the aspiration to thank God for another person, magic actually starts. And what does it end with? Lord, give me health, give me comfort, give me as much love as possible, give me material goods. The emphasis is shifted. Money, power, sex. What else? and everything else, and as much as possible, and don't forget to give it in double measure, right? After all, I'm so good. Look, while it begins with simple things, doesn't it? A subtle shift, yes, right away. A very subtle manipulation and a very subtle substitution. And it allegedly came from the Prophets. No, the Prophets said, there is God and there is you. You are responsible for yourself. No one will enter God's gate instead of you. No one will give you life but yourself. It is clear that such personalities as Jesus Christ had an opportunity to grant life to somebody or messengers or the Holy Spirit. He certainly can. The point is not in them. The point is in us, ordinary people. Can we really give anything to anyone? In this world, we can. In this world, we actually must give. And when we start serving God, Yet, what does it mean, serving God? It is when you yourself have understood, and an aspiration and a desire arises in you to help someone. Here we can help. But to thank God for giving you a good friend, or to thank not only for yourself, but for someone else, so that he begins to see the light, it's ridiculous. That's already a substitution, that's already an element of magic, a very subtle and plain one. Moreover, in dialogue with God, everyone else actually disappears, there is no… Just look, let's reveal another interesting point regarding gratitude. People often thank God for their children, or even for the fact that a person didn't have children, but then they appeared, and he is grateful to God, because the Lord has sent him children or something else, right? And in all religions it's normal to thank for everything good. We love our children, we want them, they come to us by God's will, into the material world. One more personality with an indefinite choice. Yes. It turns out that we really expect something all the time. We really don't look. And we treat God like a game. We treat God as something unclear. The trouble is that they don't explain to us since childhood what the spiritual world is and what God is and how to build a relationship. Indeed, we are not being taught. We are taught to be slaves of one or another organization, using God as a cover. Why? Because it turns out that we must serve the organization, the mediators. And just look, any organization says, you don't have the right to leave us. If you leave us, that's it. You won't get saved, you have betrayed the organization, you have betrayed God, and so on. Isn't that so? It is. Again, a person is property. Of course. And a person is property, property of either Satan or organization, or of someone else, while a person must not be property. After all, even when entering the spiritual world, a person doesn't become God's property, he becomes his part, a part of the boundless spiritual world. The difference is huge. Sufis have such an understanding, it is still preserved, when they say, either I am in you, or you are in me. These very. You also say that the truth does not belong to religions, that it exists in all religions. Of course. Indeed, if we ponder, it turns out that all the components which are needed for salvation are beyond the religious context. Every person has that very soul. I'll put it simply. 
What religion does the soul belong to? My friends, I'll ask you a simple question. What religion does God belong to? God is one for everyone, isn't He? God's love. What religion does the truth belong to? The truth is one. It cannot belong to anyone or anything, whether it is organization or somebody. God is one, and He is our God. The truth is one. It is sent by the Lord to us, right? And our soul belongs only to God. It doesn't belong to us. This is for people to understand. In order for the soul to belong to us, we must become a part of the spiritual world. And we as personalities should work very hard. We should step over Satan. We should overcome ourselves and learn to love God. That is when we have a chance that the soul will become ours. And it is not us who save the soul. We save ourselves. Nothing can happen to the soul. It is part of the spiritual world. And it is actually that door through which we can come to the Lord. Again, this door is one for everyone. And all this should unite us. However, by no means we say that religions are bad or something else. Religions are traditions. Religions are codes of laws. They are lives of millions of people. They are our history. There is nothing bad even in Satan if we are not his slaves and if he doesn't control us. Isn't that so? Great. Indeed, there is such an expression that the door of hell closes from inside, that we ourselves… Only this way. We ourselves open the door of heaven and we ourselves open the door of hell. This right is granted to us by the Lord God Himself. So the main thing is to remember that. If you start feeling miserable and bad, or if everything is grievous, then look, which door is opening you? Just close it, open the other one and leave and be happy. Isn't that right? It is. Yes, you and I have actually touched upon the stratum of ordinary human life, which we can talk about endlessly. But the main and the simplest thing is to simply love God, to love and respect each other. Then everything becomes simple, clear and understandable. When we are really devoted to the Lord God, when we really love Him, nothing prevents us from living. Do you know what else I will tell you? When a person is really in spiritual practice or indeed in a higher state, a prayerful state, where he feels God, then all these people are equal. They have no religions and they have no contradictions. Why? Because they don't have service to Satan. They are free from Satan and they are united in God. They are united in love for God. That's how we are supposed to live. Then everything falls away, all questions disappear and everything becomes empty, clear and simple. It is very simple to live. We should just love, respect each other and help one another. Love and respect the souls of all people. And the main thing is to sincerely and truly love God and not to hold grudges in ourselves not to carry this rucksack with those sins, as they say, which Satan puts for us there. It is actually our right to carry the rucksack or not. As a matter of fact, we are not Satan's slaves. No. There is an angel in each of us, and it is important to give it freedom, to release it from Satan's fetters. While the tool is one, God's love and devotion to God, and simply to love each other. Thank you, friends, for being with us. Let us simply love each other and love our God, and everything will be fine. Thank you. Thank you, Igor Mihailovich. Thank you.